Well, good morning, UPC. It's, it's really great to be with you here today, and I was delighted to be introduced by Jennifer as Dr. Stearns. Nobody ever calls me Dr. Stearns, but to, to tell you the truth, the only real doctor in my family is my sister, who is a college professor in New York. Uh, but it took her over 10 years to earn her doctorate, and I got mine for a 15-minute commencement speech. So if you're seeking a doctoral degree, I recommend the latter method. <laughs> you know, Renee and I have attended UPC for more than 20 years now. It's hard to believe. Our five kids are all grown. Uh, two of them are here. Uh, my two favorites are here. No. <laughs> and, uh, and two of my grandsons are here, and they're here with uh, their dads as well. And, uh, but we used to come to the 830 worship service for most of the time we attended here together. And you can imagine how unpopular that was, especially with the teenagers. Uh, I can remember quite a few Sundays when our son Pete would fall sound asleep during Earl Palmer's best sermons, and I kept nudging him and poking him to wake him up, hoping he would get some spiritual food from the uh, Sunday service. Uh, but surprisingly, Pete is now a senior pastor himself in North Carolina, so even though asleep, he got a lot of spiritual content from those sermons. And I know that my two grandsons who are here today will not fall asleep during my sermon because I'm watching them. <laughs> Anyways, my message today was inspired by a book that Renee and I are reading as part of our weekly couples Bible study. Before Christmas, we read through a book by Martin Copenhaver entitled, Jesus is the Question, the 307 questions Jesus asked and the three that he answered. Quite a title. Now, but if you read through the Gospels, you quickly see that Jesus asked far more questions than he answered. Uh, and they were questions like these. What are you looking for? Where is your faith? Why do you see the splinter that's in your brother's or sister's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? And this one, will you give up your life for me? So some of those questions are pretty hard-hitting. Now, I've been a Christian for about 50 years now, but I had never really focused on how Jesus was constantly asking questions. And questions that he was asked, he rarely gave a direct answer to those questions. He, his preferred approach to teaching was to ask these probing questions of people as a way to make them think more deeply about critical issues of life and faith and to challenge them to rethink their beliefs about God. If you think about it, Questions are a very powerful teaching tool, and questions help us explore our faith and apply it to our lives in new ways. So I've decided to organize my message this morning around three questions designed to stimulate just that kind of thinking in you, but unlike Jesus, I'm also going to give you some of the answers. So here we go with the first question. Where do you find meaning and purpose in your life? Now, as a leader of World Vision for 20 years and as an author of several Christian books, I've had the opportunity to have lots and lots, hundreds of conversations about faith with people over the years. And I found that most people I meet who are followers of Jesus express a deep longing in their life, a longing for meaning and purpose, uh, a deep longing uh, of calling, for a sense of calling in their, in their walk with the Lord. They want to feel like God is using them to do something significant, something that matters. But even though this is a common desire I find among Christians, I also find that most of us still have a tendency to look for meaning and purpose in other ways. We look to our work, our career, to our families, to our friendships. We look to our achievements and even to our possessions to find meaning and purpose in our lives. And it's not that those things are meaningless uh, by any means, but that's not where we find the deepest meaning and purpose in, in, our, in our lives. But if I've learned anything about meaning and purpose over my 50 years, I've learned that this deeper kind of meaning is not really found in any job or career. It's not found in any human relationship, no matter how important that relationship is, nor is it found in any great accomplishment. True meaning and purpose uh, are only found by aligning our lives with God's purposes for our lives in lives committed to following him. So in other words, it's not our careers that bring purpose and meaning to our lives, nor is it our spouses, families, education, accomplishments, 
or our financial status, but instead it's the purpose of our lives in Christ that brings meaning to everything else. So why is it that so many Christians still long for that deeper sense of meaning and purpose? You know, we go to church on Sundays, some of us join Bible studies, we say prayers, we have quiet times, uh, but we feel something is missing still. We go through the motions, don't we, sometimes? Sitting in church, sitting, standing, singing, praying, listening, then we go off to brunch, we go home to watch the Seahawks or the Mariners or today the NFL, and the AFC, NFC and AFC playoff games. Thank you for coming to this service because you're going to miss part of that first game. <laughs> you know, I think for some of us, the issue is that we can no longer see the forest for the trees. That's an expression we use to describe someone who's gotten so preoccupied by the small details of life that they've lost a sense of the bigger picture, the bigger picture. Think about it. We grow up, we go to school, maybe we get married, we start careers, we have children, and we struggle with all the daily challenges of life, you know, getting to work on time, raising those kids, making ends meet, attending church, trying to make time for friends and family in our busy lives. The years go by, and our lives are preoccupied by so many trees. But what happened to the forest? What happened to the bigger story? Who are we? Why are we here anyways? Where are we headed, and how do we fit into God's bigger story? There's a lot of questions I'm asking again to get you to think. But fortunately for Christians, we do have answers to some of these questions. I want you to think about God as an author, right? He's the author of the big story, the cosmic story, the cosmic narrative from creation to the present day. And doesn't it make sense that if he is the one who created each of us uniquely as characters in his story, he's written you into his story, doesn't it make sense that he created each of us to play a specific purpose, a specific role? In other words, God didn't create any of us to be movie extras on set just to stand on the sidelines with no role to play. He created each one of us for a purpose, to play our specific part. We each have a unique part to play in that story. And here's the thing, our lives won't feel complete until we embrace that role that he intended us to play. Let me share with you a scripture passage which might help clarify our specific role in God's plan, and it's from 2 Corinthians 5. It's a passage that meant so much to me in my 20 years at World Vision that I literally had it stenciled on my office wall so I could read it every single day. Uh, and it's the same passage that Pastor Aaron preached on with great passion just two weeks ago. And I think the fact that we're both preaching on this passage means that the Lord really wants you to hear it again. Uh, Hopefully I'll have a few different thoughts. Here it is. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And there it is, the job description of every single follower of Christ. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. He gives us this task of reconciling people to him. And we are given the title Christ's Ambassadors because God is making his appeal to the world through us, through you and me. Now, you may be a student. You may be an accountant or a programmer or a nurse, a homemaker, a plumber, a teacher, a retiree, or even an Uber driver or a corporate executive. But your real job description is that of ambassador for Christ. You see, Jesus wants to repurpose us as his ambassadors. And think about what ambassadors do. They represent and they embody the character, the values, the priorities, and the interests of the one who sent them. Pastor Aaron said two weeks ago that reconciliation is an act of restoring beauty in humanity. So how do we do that? Well, simply put, by the way we live. We restore beauty to humanity by the way we live. We are called to live compelling lives 
so filled with God's love, God's compassion, God's sense of justice, and God's character, lives so attractive to a watching world that we will point people to Jesus by the way we live our lives. When we show people the love of Christ and the character of Christ, we draw people to the cross of Christ. Think about that. This is the assignment that each one of us has been given. This is where we will find our deepest meaning and purpose in our lives. And that is why God wrote your character and mine into this big cosmic story that he's writing. You see, as Christ's ambassador, everything else in your life has a new purpose, a new meaning. You're his ambassador in your workplace. You're his ambassador in your neighborhood, in your extended family, and in your daily encounters with people of all kinds. And think about this. God has placed you strategically in a sphere of influence that no other person has that exact sphere of influence that you have, only you. As his ambassador, no human encounter you have is now insignificant. Every interaction is laden with purpose and opportunity. And everything you possess can also now be used by God. Your time, your talent, your home, your assets, your work, your career, and your relationships. Remember what I said earlier, it's not our careers that bring purpose and meaning to our lives, nor is it our spouses, families, education, accomplishments, or our financial status. Rather, it's the purpose of our lives in Christ that brings meaning to everything else. But there's a catch. In order to be Christ's ambassador, he asks you to surrender everything else, everything in your life to him. You see, you can't serve two masters. He invites you, but you have to be willing. And that leads me to my second question. Are you willing to be open to God's will for your lives? You know, the very act of becoming a Christian is about surrender, right? It's surrendering our lives to God, confessing our sinfulness, committing ourselves to follow Jesus wherever he might lead us. And here's where I want to share some of my personal story and testimony with you this morning. Fifty years ago next month, February of 1974, in my dormitory at the Wharton School of Business in Pennsylvania, I committed my life to the Lord. After years of skepticism and unbelief, I got down on my knees, I uttered a feeble prayer to God, asking him to forgive my sins, and I promised him that day to devote my life to him, to live as he called me to live, to do what he called me to do, and to go where he called me to go. And then I just said, amen. That's all I knew to say. My prayer was literally that short, and I had no idea where it would lead me. But what it represented <clears throat> was a surrender of my life to him that I would no longer be driven by my desires, but by God's desires for me. I would surrender my ambitions for Christ's ambitions for me. Of course, in the years ahead, I learned it was much easier said than done. Now, if we're honest, there are verses in the Bible we'd prefer they weren't there. We'd like to kind of tear that page out of the Scripture. For me, one of those verses is Matthew 16, 25. For whoever desires to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, most of us don't really want to surrender control of our lives to, to God. We often try to make a deal with God, don't we? I'll surrender most of my life, Lord, but I have a few things I would still like to control. It might be our career. It might be our love life. It might be our money. It might be a bad habit. It might even be the places we're willing to live and the places we're not willing to live. We all have our conditions, don't we? But you see, God is not interested in negotiating our terms of surrender. He just wants all of us. He wants us in. Well, hold that thought. I want to fast forward 20 years from my little prayer in my dorm room. And uh, because that's when God really came into my life and Renee's life to take me up on my promise of surrender. Let me set the stage for you. Over those next 24 years, I graduated from the Wharton School. Renee and I had lived the American dream. Uh, after decades of hard work, I had become the CEO of Lennox China, the luxury tableware company based in New Jersey. I had 4,000 people working for me. I was 46 years old and at the pinnacle of my career. Renee and I had been blessed with five kids, all well above average, <laughs> by the way. 
and our grandchildren are even more above average. And we were living in our dream house in Pennsylvania, an 1803 Fieldstone farmhouse on five acres. We were deeply involved at our church in Pennsylvania. Renee led the women's ministry there, and I was on the board of our kids' Christian school. You see, God had really blessed us, and life was, life was great. Life was good. And then one day, the phone rang in my office, and it was an executive recruiter. Now, my secretary knew that I always took these calls from recruiters because, hey, maybe there's a bigger job with a bigger salary and more money. You can imagine how my heart sank when I learned that this recruiter was not looking for a new CEO somewhere big, but for the Christian ministry World Vision, and I was pretty sure there would be no more money in that. But somehow, on that call, I had a, a sense that this could be a dangerous uh, conversation. So I was determined to get off the phone fairly quickly with this recruiter. So I interrupted his spiel, and I said, look, sorry, but I, I'm really not qualified for a job like that. I, I'm not really interested. And by the way, I'm not available. <laughs> I'm not available. You see, this calling made no sense to me. I knew nothing about global poverty. I had never even been to Africa or seen real poverty. I had no theological training to lead a gigantic Christian organization. I'd never done any fundraising, and I learned when I got to World Vision that I had to raise $3 million a day, 365 days a year. Some days that's easier than others. If you're a fundraiser out there, you know that. But all of these things were critically important to this job that the recruiter was talking to me about. And so I told him, I said, you do know I'm running a luxury goods company selling fancy dishes to the wealthy, don't you? And despite my efforts to get off the phone as quickly as possible, this recruiter was annoyingly persistent. <laughs> he wanted to at least meet me uh, for dinner to discuss the opportunity, and I kept saying, no, I'm not going to meet you for dinner. This is not going to happen. Well, finally, when he saw I had no intention of taking this conversation further, he said, let me ask you a different question, Rich. Are you willing to be open to God's will for your life? He asked me that question. And there it was, the question that stopped me dead in my tracks. Isn't that an uncomfortable question, especially for a stranger to ask you? In my particular case, it was especially uncomfortable because I realized it could mean quitting my job, ending my career, selling our beautiful house, taking a huge pay cut, leaving our friends all behind, and moving our five kids, most of them weren't happy, 2,500 miles to Seattle where the sun never shines. <laughs> so all of these things are running through my head as he's saying, have dinner with me. So after a long pause, I, this is how I answered the question. His name was Rob. I said, Rob, of course I want to be open to God's will for my life, but I am pretty sure this is not it. <laughs> and he said, let's have dinner and find out. Now, I often refer to this as my rich young ruler moment. You all know that story in Scripture. A rich young man, a pillar of the Jewish community, comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus first tells him, well, you should obey the Ten Commandments. And he lists a few of the commandments. And the young man says to him with a bit of pride, because he was a pillar of his community, I've done all that, Jesus. I've kept all the commandments. Uh, I've got it covered. You know, check me out. Check my reputation. Now, this young man could have stopped right there. He could have thanked Jesus and walked away, but instead he pushed his luck. He decided to ask Jesus another question. He said, Jesus, is there anything else I still lack? As you'll see in a moment, he should have quit while he was ahead because this was what Jesus answered. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go, go. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Let's just say this was not the answer the man had hoped for. Sell everything I have, give it to the poor, and then follow you. The next verse in this passage is another one of those I wanted to tear out of the Bible at that moment. Because it says this, at this the man's face fell, I bet it did, and he went away sad for he had many possessions. Now you see, for Jesus, it really wasn't about the money. Jesus understood something, that this young man was not fully surrendered. 
all of us have something we don't want to surrender. And for this man, it was his status and his wealth. These were the things that were hindering him from a total commitment of his life to the Lord. Well, anyways, back to my story. I reluctantly agreed to meet the recruiter for dinner, quite certain that it wouldn't lead anywhere. I thought no board of directors in their right mind would pick a guy running a luxury tableware company to run World Vision. Uh, nevertheless, two months after that dinner, against all of that reason and logic, World Vision offered me the job. Now, metaphorically speaking, the reason I use the rich young ruler, Jesus was asking me and Renee to do the same thing that he'd asked that young man to do. Sell everything we had, our home, my career, our close friendships, our church, our kids' school, my salary, our financial security, and give them to serving the poor and following him. And over the next 20 years, we would follow him into some of the most difficult places on earth, places of human suffering, refugee camps, famine areas, the AIDS pandemic, war zones, devastating natural disasters, and grinding poverty. Are you willing to be open to God's will for your life? It really is an uncomfortable question. I have to ask, how would you answer that question today? Are there things you're holding back that you haven't surrendered yet to the Lord? And that brings me to my final question today. Some of you wondered, when's he going to get to the loaves and fishes? How many loaves do you have? Question number three. So far this morning, I've suggested that as followers of Jesus, our lives have been repurposed. Every one of us is called to be Christ's ambassador in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and throughout our sphere of relationships. I've also raised the question of fully and sacrificially surrendering our lives to God's purposes, trusting that he will use us as he thinks best. But in my experience, there's still one sticking point that hinders a lot of us in making that commitment to the Lord. We doubt that God could really use us. One of the most common mistakes we can make is to believe that we have nothing of significance to offer. We're not smart enough, we're not skilled enough, we're not rich enough or spiritual enough to be useful to the Lord. And so we sit on the sidelines because we can't believe that the coach might actually want to put us in the game. That's exactly how I felt about the World Vision job. How could God possibly use a guy selling luxury tableware to help the poor. It made no sense. So what about this third question? How many loaves do you have? It's from the familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000, and it reveals a very powerful truth. Let me summarize the story, with, which is in all four of the Gospels, by the way. It was that important that it, it, it showed up in all four of the Gospels. The disciples came to Jesus with a problem, a crisis. Um, it was late in the day, and 5,000 people who had followed Jesus, probably more because that number would not have counted all the women and children, they were hungry and they needed food. The disciples' solution to this was to tell Jesus, hey, let's just send all these people away to the town so they could buy their own food, right? Seems like a logical plan. How are we going to feed 5,000 people? But no, Jesus calmly looks at them and says, you give them something to eat. Really, Jesus? Us. You want us to feed five, eight, ten thousand people? You can't be serious. You know, is this, we're supposed to laugh at this? Philip, one of the disciples, even did the math and calculated for Jesus, and Jesus really needed help with math. He calculated that it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough food for this many people. But I love it. I love Jesus' response. He ignores all their complaining, he ignores the math. He ignores the whining, and he just asks them a simple question. How many loaves do you have? How many loaves do you have? They tell Jesus that they have five loaves and two fish. Apparently, a young boy had enough faith, and he offered his lunch uh, to split 5,000 ways. In other words, the disciples were saying, you see, Jesus, I told you we don't have enough food. I mean, this little kid brought his lunch. Uh, surely now you realize how hopeless this is. But once again, they're freaking out, but Jesus just calmly responds to them, and he says, bring them here to me. Bring what you have to me. And we all know what happened next. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. 
Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. Wow. Jesus performs one of the most amazing miracles, amazing miracles captured in Scripture. There's four things I want you to see from that story just quickly. First, the disciples felt totally overwhelmed by the size of the challenge, but they completely underestimated the power of God. They just looked at the size of the challenge. They didn't look at the size of their God. Second, notice that Jesus, Jesus did not ask them how much food it would take to feed so many people. He only asked them how many loaves they had. Third point, Jesus then took what they had and he did the multiplying. He blessed it, giving thanks to God the Father, and then performed the miracle by vastly multiplying that young boy's offering. Now, the fourth thing, and this is kind of snarky of Jesus, the disciples collected 12 baskets of leftovers, one for each disciple. Maybe he wanted each of them to have a souvenir to remind them of their lack of faith. So how does this apply to us? The question Jesus asks of each of us is simply this, how many loaves do you have? And then bring them here to me. Because if you will just bring them here to me, I'll multiply them. I'll multiply them. Now, I've already told you how that executive recruiter and I felt that I felt totally unqualified to lead World Vision, that I didn't have the knowledge, the experience, or the qualifications to lead such a global ministry. At my moment of decision, much like the disciples, I was saying to Jesus, don't you see that I can't possibly do this job? It's too big, too important. I just don't have what it takes. I don't have enough loaves. Nevertheless, though, a few months later, I showed up on my very first Monday in my office at Federal Way, my new office. I arrived early that morning, and I shut my door, and I began to cry out to the Lord. And I mean cry. I mean, there were tears. Lord, I said it took every bit of courage I had to just show up today. I am terrified. I have no idea what to do next or how to lead this organization. I'm, not, I'm just not qualified. I feel helpless. I, I'm way over my head. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Please, will you help me? You called me to this job, and now you need to show up, or this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> and that's when I felt God answer me. I, I heard him say, Rich, I, I, finally have I finally have you exactly where I want you, helpless, totally dependent on me. You see, I've got this, Rich. I didn't need your ability. I just wanted your availability your obedience. You've done what I asked by accepting the call. Now, just keep showing up and watch what I do. Watch what I do. And so that's what I did. I didn't get fired that first year as I was certain I would. I just kept showing up and offering the few loaves and fishes that I had. And Jesus kept keeping his promises to me. When I retired after 20 years of service at World Vision, Ironically, I had become the longest-serving president in World Vision's 70-year history. Uh, and just like the disciples in the feeding of the 5,000, God gave me a front-row seat to see a miracle. In fact, many, many miracles. You see, I got to be his ambassador to the least of these, to the poor, to the oppressed, to the sick and the vulnerable. And it became the greatest advent adventure of my life, and I think Renee would say the same, the greatest adventure of our life as we traveled around the world. I flew more than 2 million air miles to more than 60 countries, and I got to see the hungry being fed and people taught to fish and farm. I watched wells being drilled and the thirsty given water. I got to see the, hic the sick healed and the lame walk and the blind being given back their sight. I met refugees who'd been resettled and disaster victims who'd been restored. I saw widows comforted and orphans cared for, young girls freed from slavery and abuse. I saw schools built, clinics opened, babies vaccinated, microloans lifting the poor out of poverty. I saw these things from a front row seat, this amazing gospel transforming the most broken of lives and flooding the world's darkest places with the radiant light of hope. I got to see what's possible when we offer our meager loaves and fishes to the Lord. 
How many loaves do you have? Bring them here to me. Watch what I do. And here's what I learned from all of this. Simply this, God will never ask you to give what you do not have, but he cannot use what you will not give. He cannot use what you will not give. Moses had only a shepherd's crook, a shepherd's staff. David had his sling. Esther had access to the king's ear. Mary had a willing heart. Peter knew how to fish. Paul had his pen. And God used each one of them to change the world. You see, all he asks of us is that we make ourselves and all we have available to him. Bring them here to me, he says, and I'll do the rest. Questions. Questions really do provoke us to think and rethink the things we thought we knew. And they help us discover God's purposes for our lives. So where do you find meaning and purpose in your life? Are you willing, really willing, to be open to God's will for your life? And then how many loaves do you have? Those are my three questions for you today. I hope you'll take these questions to the Lord this week in prayer. Make yourself completely available to him and see what happens. It might lead to your life's greatest adventure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, challenge us today with these questions. Help us discover your purpose for our lives. Give us the courage to surrender our desires for your desires for us. And as we leave this place today, help us to see ourselves as ambassadors of your great love in our workplaces, our families, and our communities. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, man.